Hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of the Ice Cream for Everyone podcast. I'm your host, Willem Vanderhorst. Well, guys, this is exciting news. I've just moved into my brand new place in London. I'm in East London now. I've just set up and plugged in the mic to be able to record this intro, just like put all my stuff away. Um, I have a beautiful view. I set up my new desk right in front of this big window overlooking lovely gardens and a really nice church. Um, it is, and also this old brick, really like red brick building that used to be a uh, German hospital back in the, well, before the First World War, I believe, actually. So until the 20s, well, no, not the 20s, sorry. Uh, until 1914, basically, 1950. So early, late 19th, early 20th century building, which is quite interesting. Uh, it's a bright blue day. It's uh, great always to see London in such beautiful weather, even though it's really cold. Uh, that I'm not too crazy about, but hey, that's, you, you can't have everything at one time. So it's still the end of winter. I don't know. Well, I mean, technically it is still winter anyway. But it's supposed to be spring in just a few days, and this just doesn't really exactly feel like spring temperature just yet. But I'm still getting, you know, used to the temperate weather after having spent a few years in the tropics. I will now stop complaining about that. Anyway, um, if ever you're listening to me ramble on for the first time, in this show, this is a show where I interview, have quite long interviews with creators and thinkers from a variety of different backgrounds that I'm basically selfishly interested in learning about. I work in marketing and advertising strategy, so I tend to interview people in those areas uh, and in the area of media. And because I'm also a gamer and I'm a long-time role-playing and tabletop gamer, uh, video games, I'm just really interested in the phenomenon of playing games in general. So I interview professionals and designers in gaming and professionals in design because I really like the process of how things are created that way. So you can check all the list of everything, uh, the list of the people I've interviewed. So... All the podcasts and all the different episodes are on Stitcher, uh, which is something that I use, but I know it's still a minority. The majority of people use iTunes, uh, so uh, the show is on iTunes, of course, so you can look up Ice Cream for Everyone, or the links are in the show notes, uh, so you can subscribe on both of those or any other podcast app you might be using. Uh, you can also find all the episodes on my website, that's www.icecreamforeveryone.net. Uh, everything is spelled out, icecreamforeveryone.net, all attached, all spelled out. All you know, small letters. Uh, it's easy. If ever you check out the show on iTunes and Stitcher, it would be fantastic if you can leave a rating or a review. Take a few minutes to leave a rating or review. You can't imagine how much it helps. It really helps other people find the show. And subscribe, of course, obviously. Subscribe to it. Um, and uh, other than that, on the website, I also write. I write a weekly newsletter called Ice Cream Sunday. Uh, special star points to the people who guess what day it's published on email. But I also publish it on medium.com. I publish it on my website. Topics vary. It tends to be long form ish. I also write occasional articles on my blog, but it, it tends to be more about marketing. The newsletter can be just about anything and everything that comes to mind. Um, and uh, I'd love to hear what you think about it. I always love to hear what people think about the writing, of course. You can also keep in touch via Twitter. I'm at HippoWill on Twitter. You can ask me questions. You can get in touch with me via the website. And you can also, finally, like my Facebook page. It's called, guess what? Ice Cream for Everyone. Uh, you can like the Facebook page, get updates from Ice Cream for Everyone. You're not going to be bombarded with stuff. You're going to get new episodes of the podcast pretty much on a weekly by weekly basis and the newsletter. Occasionally, if I find a really quirky and interesting article about ice cream, I might post it there as well. Anyway. Um, I'm also looking for a new contract work at the moment. I'm just finishing a freelance gig right now, uh, this month. So the month of March, 2016. And looking for a new piece of work. So if ever you need uh, any advice for your marketing, digital marketing strategy, branding, anything like it, or just to understand better what I do, just don't hesitate to give me a shout. Moving on. Uh, that was a lot about myself, but anyway. My guest today, let's talk about our guest. This is more interesting. Rahel Thompson. Rahel is a brand strategist at the Barbarian Group, which is ironic given the kind of studies that she's done. And we do mention that in the episode. But if you've listened to my interview with Heather Lefevre that I published a few weeks ago, while we're talking about role-playing games, she mentions Rahel's studies in live-action role-playing games. LARP, uh, for short, so that's how the LARP is called. Uh, and she introduced us. Uh, and Rahel, Rahel sorry, is based in New York. We had a fantastic conversation talking about her identity, gender and sexuality studies, her cultural anthropology studies. So she studied the world of live-action role-playing games and people practicing it in the UK. 
so she traveled around Scotland and parts of the UK. We also talked about latest trends and technologies, science fiction influences, uh, a few thoughts here and there about virtual reality. So, I mean, it was a lot of fun. It was a really good conversation. So I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. And uh, without further ado, here is Rachel. <laughs> Hey, how are you? I'm doing well, and you? Fine, thank you. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much for joining me for this. So you're in New York at the moment. It's the morning for you, right? It is. It is. I am in, I'm in Brooklyn right now, so bright and early. Exciting. Um, so I usually start with a warm-up question. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I saw that one of the things that you presented yourself as on Twitter is <laughs> a serial knitter. Oh my goodness. Yeah, you've checked out my Twitter. Yes. Um, I'm a big knitter. It's definitely something that helps me relax. I like the patterns. Um, I recently finished a cowl. That's been my latest project. Sorry, a what? A cowl? A, a cowl, like a big, uh, like a wraparound scarf. Oh, okay. Got scarf. it. Yeah, infinite scarf. A friend of mine had her mm-hmm. grandmother knit a scarf, but that's also a hood. So there's a hood and then the rest of it is a scarf. Oh, that's Did you cool. ever come across that? No, I haven't made one of those yet. Um, I really want to create a, a, a sweater is my goal. A sweater, uh-huh. I think, is like everyone's goal. So that's that's what I think I'll be working on for next winter. And I yeah. saw like you posted a few months ago a tweet of uh, f- coming from the, the Pepsi thread of like uh-huh. somebody that knitted the Pepsi logo. <laughs> that that uh, wasn't yeah. you, was it? It, it was actually. It was um, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I work at the Barbarian Group, which is um, an agency in, in New York City. And we're responsible. We're Pepsi's digital agency of record. And so we our own all of their social channels. Okay. So one of the creative concepts um, that the the team came up with was knitting a, a, co, a, a, co, a koozie, excuse me, for your Pepsi bottle. So they they got me to do that. So it was a lot of fun. I'm so pleased. <laughs> That's fun. Are there yeah. any, any other brands you're planning to knit the logo of in the near future? Um, no, uh, but you know, I'm always I'm always open to the option in case there are any brands out there that want anything knitted. <laughs> Give okay, me a so call. That anybody anybody <laughs> listening from the brand side of things, Rachel can knit your logo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so just so let, let's go from the beginning here. Uh, yeah. Where are you from? Yeah, so um, I grew up in Dallas, Texas. Um, I'm not sure if you can tell, I've kind of a, a weird accent, um, but I was born in South Africa, lived in Canada for a little while, but grew up, um, but grew up mostly in Texas. Funny, yeah. uh, you're the second person I talked to uh, this week who was born in South Africa and then moved to Canada. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah, yeah. there's a there's a fair few of us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then in but then Dallas for most of your upbringing, kind Correct. of childhood. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, what were you into as a kid? Like you know, interests, hobbies, or yeah, I was a big reader. I think uh, that's definitely something that uh, I still do today. Big reader. Um, because I traveled so much, I really have enjoyed, you know, just getting to know cultural aspects of cities. Um, my favorite thing, again, since I'm in New York, is just, you know, taking a Saturday afternoon and just kind of walking around the different aspects, uh, different historical areas of the city. Um, this past weekend, I went to Greenwood Cemetery, which uh, is just a giant 400 acre cemetery. So that's something I. I used to enjoy doing was just exploring cities and reading cool. and discovering as much as I could. Yeah. Oh, uh, by the way, by some of the to- notes I took from my site, I think I mispronounced your name. Is it supposed to be pronounced Rachel? Uh, yeah, Rachel. Yeah, Raquel. Raquel or Rahel? Ra- sorry. Oh, Raquel's fine. Yeah. Well, you tell me. Tell me how it's supposed oh, to be it, pronounced. Oh, it's, it's, it's pronounced Rachel, but that, Rachel. that sound okay, cool. can be... Oh, wait. Yeah. Your name is Willem. You can pronounce the ha sound. <laughs> <laughs> it's, fine. it's fine. You just tell me how it's supposed to be yeah. pronounced. Mm-hmm. But I I do understand the feeling of saying, no, it's fine. Whatever. It's just, yeah, 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 exactly. I, I have that pretty often. It's like, what's your name? Willem. Philip. Well, yeah, sure. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, want. I was wondering, because you're, you're Belgian? My originally? father is Dutch. Dutch. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm uh, not Dutch, but my yeah. father is Dutch from Rotterdam. And so I have a very Dutch name. But yes. I was born in the US and raised in France. Oh, wow. So I've got French and English, uh, but I usually, you know, I, sometimes I correct people on how my name is pronounced, but it depends on the circumstances, essentially. Yeah, sometimes course, I'm like, yeah. it just doesn't matter, particularly if it's somebody <laughs> I'm not going to see again. I'm like, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Cool. It's fine. Yeah. Um, cool. So what kind of stuff did you read? Like, do you have any favorite genres or books or? Yeah, I was a big, I was a big fantasy fan. Um, okay. 
huge fantasy fan, actually. Uh, it was kind of nice when Harry Potter became popular because all of my interests suddenly were kind of cool. Um, but I, I grew up on, you know, C.S. Lewis, um, yeah. Diana Winnie Jones, who was this big uh, English author. She wrote Cresto-Mancy books. And Neil Gaiman um, yeah. is still one of my biggest, one of my biggest uh, favorites. I love Neil books. Gaiman. <laughs> yeah. He's uh, uh, my hero. Sorry. Oh, no, I was saying he's my hero. That's all. Yes. Absolutely. I definitely, I mean, I, I love all of his work and I love it when he intervenes. Any of his talks are amazing or usually the most of the causes he supports are amazing as well. It, it's just, yeah, he's a brilliant, brilliant author. Are you looking forward to the TV adaptation of uh, American Gods? So, um, yes, yes and no. I think, I think it's every fan's trepidation. Actually, let's, let's try back. Can you just quickly explain the overall of what American Gods, which is a book from Neil Gaiman for anybody listening who might not know. And tell them just quickly what it's about and then, yeah. Yeah, sure. So American Gods is essentially, it's a tale of imagine if the gods that all the different cultures that came to America believed in were real. So um, you've got the fairies coming out of Ireland. Uh, you've got um, Egyptian gods involved. You have the Norse gods because, um, that come at, that arrive. But it's, it's really every sort of mythology that any sort of immigrant in the U.S. ever had imagine if they were real and they were living just underneath the surface in America. Yeah. Um, so it's a really, it's a really beautiful tale of a man who, you know, has just come out of jail. There's almost a redemption story and he's asked, uh, he, he gets involved in this, in this world. Um, and it's, it's really beautiful. Again, it's, it kind of goes into this interest that I had as a child, you know, trying to understand fantasy, understand adventure and understand belonging almost which i think is a, a really fascinating subject hmm. um so there's going to be a new adaptation and i am really excited about it uh whenever something that you love is adapted into into a film or a tv show i think there's always that concern um and so, but i think it's gonna be great and because his hand he's so involved in it it'll be it'll be really good i believe really mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and I understand you also, and we'll, we'll go talking about your studies a little bit more and further, but you also were into tabletop gaming or gaming of some kind or? Yes. So um, I, I received my master's in cultural anthropology at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. And um, my master's degree uh, focused on live action role play. So um, I had gotten really involved in it as an academic subject um, in in grad school, um, I had had, you know, my, my then boyfriend was like, listen, I think this is something that you'd be really fascinated in, um, based on create, uh, creation of identity, creation of community. Um, and also just cause it's generally fun. So, but before um, you studied it, you <laughs> hadn't played any live action role play, had you? Um, you no, except for once in college in which my friend uh, smashed me across the face. Um, that was my <laughs> only experience. Yeah. She, she and I were both very new to it, did not realize that was okay. not acceptable. <laughs> and, and how, and like, and any other types of like board games or tabletop role playing games, had you practiced any of that before? I, I, I dabbled in it, but I had never um, been regularly involved. It had always been an interest of mine in theory, but never really something that I wanted. I had I had never had a group to do it with. All right, um, got it. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Mm -hmm. uh, so in just time, like, we'll, we'll come back to that in more details. Uh, mm -hmm. But just to finish the cursus, you, you studied in St. Louis? Correct. Yes. So I received my undergraduate degree um, at WashU in St. Louis, in St. Louis, Missouri. Mm -hmm. um, and for the listeners out there, that's the middle of the country. It's known for the St. Louis Arch. Um, it's a small, uh, it's a small city, but it's, um, it's really special. Yeah, um, I actually was there when I was nine years old. Oh, really? Oh, for that's a so day, funny. It was kind of random. Yeah. Oh, like what? visiting, well, we were visiting the States for uh, a couple of training programs with my elder brother and my father. And I, I have no idea, would have to ask my father again why, but he decided that like we were going from New York to Los Angeles and stopped in St. Louis, but I don't know why, but mm -hmm. he thought it would be a cool thing to do for my big brother's birthday. And it was in August, sweltering hot, like ridiculously hot. Uh, and I spent the day essentially moaning because it was too hot and I didn't want, <laughs> want to walk that much. There was not much of a walker when I was a kid. I like walking now. Yeah, well, that's good. <laughs> Um, so that's my main experience of St. Louis, or more recently, the TV show from Sci-Fi Defiance, where you can see the broken arc. Oh, yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, so you studied um, arts, and I'm mentioning it because I thought the subline was interesting because it mentions on your LinkedIn profile that you majored in arts, women, gender, and sexuality studies. 
Yes. Uh-huh. That was my, that was my major. I was, I've always been very interested in the creation of, of identity and identity politics. Yeah. Um, the reason, so I'm, as, as I've, I told you earlier that I'm, I'm work for the barbarian group. I'm a strategist in advertising, but that was never really my original intention. I, I kind of expected to go into a more academic path. Um, hence my degree in, in cultural anthropology, mm. um, which I thought was a, a broader extension of, um, gender studies, but that I could employ in my, in my learnings. Yeah. Yeah, sure. But how mm-hmm. did you find out about, uh, advertising and, and, uh, strategy and planning and advertising? Yeah. Um, so that's, a, that's a kind of an interesting story. Um, after I got my master's, I knew two things, one that I needed to come home, um, and back to the U S. Um, mm. I loved living abroad. I loved the Netherlands. Um, and I had a really solid base there, but you know, 20, 23 years old, I was like, okay, I need to figure out what's next. And, um, I knew that I need to come back. And then I also had not taken any break from academics. And I figured if I wanted to give, you know, everything a fair shot, I should take a minute. And I, I ended up interning at, um, Crispin Porter and Bogusky, uh, mm-hmm. soon afterwards where, um, actually Heather, who you, you interviewed a few weeks ago, yes. that's where I met her very briefly. Um, and I realized I really enjoyed it. I, I knew that my interest in understanding people, understanding how they tick, um, that would be a benefit to me in marketing and advertising. And so it just, it was a, it was a series of happy accidents that led me uh, into marketing and I really enjoy it. What, what's the happy accident, unless I missed it in what you were saying, but what led you to the internship in the first place at Crispy Porter? You just... uh, it was just, um, a, just networking friends of friends that introduced me to it. So I was living in Dallas at the uh-huh. time and Crispin's main office is in Boulder. Yeah. And then um, just somebody I knew, knew somebody at their holding part, uh, holding company, MDC, who then introduced me to a human resource, uh, right. somebody in human resources there. Just like somebody said, oh, have you thought of this? It's like, cool company. Pretty much. Yeah, yeah. It, it was, it was cool. It was something right. that I'd never expected and I really love now. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so like coming back, we're just like bouncing back and forth, but it's kind of cool. Uh, you studying in Dallas, uh, yeah. you're part of a fraternity apparently over there. Oh my goodness. Yes. So <laughs> <laughs> you are so good at this. Um, yeah. So I was in Chi Omega, which is a, a sorority in the U S um, everyone. Yes, sorority, always, of course. Sorry. Yes. They're, they're oh, it's called a fraternity. Um, oh, it is. So that's yes, very mysterious. But- I grew up in Europe, right? So, mm-hmm. so the only experience I have of this, this stuff is like teenage movies mm-hmm. and like, articles I might read sometimes that are usually exploring the dark sides of these places. <laughs> um, yeah, there weren't very many dark sides of Chi Omega. Um, we, well, I, so my university was extremely nerdy. Um, so we right. didn't, we didn't have houses. It was just a lot of women kind of supporting and loving one another, really just saying, you know, we can do this together. Mm. So a lot of our activities were, you know, very much about like developing, you know, sisterhood and um going on activities and i actually what's really funny is uh who i live with in new york and my roommate is actually was also a member of my sorority so it was a big yeah it was a big impact on me brilliant and then so how did you how did the opportunity to go to the netherlands come about yeah so um my junior year um i my one of my professors encouraged me to study abroad and I knew that I wanted to study. I, I wanted to study abroad in a place where I could speak English. Um, mm-hmm. And they had an excellent gender studies program at uh, Utrecht University. So um, I ended up just going there for five months, really loving it, and then discovered that there was a they they were just about to start a master's degree in cultural anthropology. Um, so I thought, you know what, let's you know, let's, let's, let's try it out. And I, you know, I was really lucky. I'm fortunate enough to, they offered me a scholarship. And so I, I couldn't turn that down. Um, and so after my first stint in the Netherlands was five months and then my second stint was about two years. Cool. So yeah. for anybody who's not super aware of that and might be listening, how would you in a nutshell describe what cultural anthropology is? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So cultural anthropology is the study of systems and cultures. Um, so really it's, I, I know that sounds almost repetitive, but it really is. It's the study of how people and societies work together. 
Um, so you'll have um, people that focus on, it can be a broad number of subjects. You'll yeah. have people who are interested in, in post-conflict societies. You'll have people who are interested in rituals. You'll have people that are interested in familial practices. Um, but it really only, can, it's, it's not an, it's maybe 150 years old, the discipline, yeah. um, but it's spawned a lot of really interesting disciplines. Like sociology is very much involved um, psychology is, is a part of it so it's in that it's in that mixture yeah mm -hmm. uh, and so like i interrupted earlier when you started talking about the story of going to study live action role play uh, -huh. uh yeah so so you were talking about it with your boyfriend at the time i guess uh -huh. in the netherlands mm -hmm. yes. and and then how did you go into it like you know w w w how did you start yeah so i i read a lot i went back to you right. know that old standby of reading and i i was trying to figure out what it was that was interesting. So I started reading about Scandinavian LARP. Um, so live action role play is, it's very different across the world, like extremely, extremely different. So for instance, in Russia, people use real weapons, um, you know, blunted weapons, but real weapons. Um, in the US, or what's most popular is um, a LARP called a uh, boffer LARP, mm -hmm. which is essentially, which is, sorry. No, ahead. no, I was just going to say, mm -hmm. let's, I'm just thinking to be aware and, and, Mindful mm -hmm. of the people who might not know what we're talking mm -hmm. about. Of course, Just explain yes. what live action role play is. Yes, live action I mean, role otherwise play. Otherwise, people might be th thinking of you know leather or which leather <laughs> might be involved in live action. Which role is, play, is, but, is <laughs> part. Yeah, so but it's not Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not necessarily. Um, it might be but. not always. Yeah. Um, so the best way I I like to describe it is um, first of all I ask people if they've heard of Dungeons and Dragons, and I'm assuming that most people who are listening to your podcast uh, ha do know tabletop role-playing. Certainly role the ones do interested know. in live-action role-playing. Yeah, play. exactly. But we're going to have the advertisers listen as well to That's this true. one. That's what I'm excited so about. So basically, it was based originally, um, tabletop role-playing was a, was a role-playing game. I like kind of going back into the history of it, sure. which you would create this a persona, this character that would have different um, advantages and disadvantages, and you would embody that character while playing a game, um, and typically the setting would be fantasy. Um, um, maybe in a in a in a cave or in a dungeon or something like that, somewhere where there was adventure, um, and you would roll the dice, and that would say whether you won or whether you lost uh, a certain encounter. Um, but what's cool about live action role play is it really in the UK, which is where I practiced, um, was it was in the 80s, they were like, you know what we can do? We can do this for real. And so people would dress up as these characters and um, they would embody these personas and they would create a name and say like, this is, I'm arrogant, but I'm also very clever. Like they would have these ideas. And um, then in addition, because obviously it's it's fun to play, it's, it's, it's very much based in play and excitement, you would fight. Um, and so that's always what I think intrigues a lot of people. The first thing they notice about live action role play is that it's not only an, an embodiment of a persona, but also the physical act of playing it. So you would have um, these foam, foam covered with swords and shields. Occasionally you'll have people dressed in full armor and they'll physically act in it and they'll, and they'll fight with one another. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a, it's a bit of play. It's a bit of acting. It's, it's a lot, it's a, it's a lot of performativity. It's really interesting. So you had all the theory, you read a lot about it and mm -hmm. then, and then what, like what, what led you down to the UK? And then I, I emailed people and then I, I, there was a, there's a group in the net in Glasgow. So I was based in Glasgow called the Cuckoo's Nest. And I emailed them and I said, Hey, I'm, I'm interested in studying LARP. Um, I was, I'm planning on coming to the UK. Um, do you mind if I just tag along with you for five months? And they said, yeah, sure. Um, so they would have games every Sunday. Um, and I would go to those regular games, which are often smaller. And then, then they would also have um, games throughout the, throughout the year um, mm -hmm. with, different, with different groups. So there would be these regular games on Sundays that were more um, that you would see more frequently. And then you'd have games. There was one in, that I would go to once a month in Edinburgh, which was a vampire lark, for instance, or yep. ones that I, I used to do go, vampire lark. Yeah. It's, it's which is very different as yep. well than very different. the one I was discussing. Um, yeah. Cool. So yeah. It was uh, cool. And did you, uh, well, let's see what, what's one interesting fun or anecdote from the, one of the five months. Yeah. Um, Okay. So the, my favorite act, my favorite experience um, was early on in my research in September and it was a th three day, 
it was a three day, no, excuse me, three day weekend event in the middle of the country called Maelstrom in a system that no longer exists. Um, it was the final, it was the final uh, game of that system. What's that? Um, was it like medieval fantasy type thing or? It was, it was kind of alternate it was fantasy but it was alternate universe fantasy so you would have people dressed as these almost snake people you would have dragons involved okay. it was really cool and um it's it was put on by a pr- uh, company called profound decisions um which still operates in the uk it's a really great group of uh larpers um in case anyone's listening and wants yeah. to get involved i'll check it out um, and, and find the links as well so we can add that to the show notes absolutely when it's published. great people um and so I, so everyone there had these characters that they had um, been portraying for many years, but I came in and what they needed was um, what is typically called a monster role. And so it, essentially what that is, it's an NPC, it's a non-player character. Um, so it's the person that directs you towards a goal or it's a person that you need to fight to accomplish um, to get to the treasure is the way I like to think of it. So over the course of three days, I was able to play three very, very different roles. Um, one was just somebody who just stood around and acted as a guard and almost as a background player. Mm-hmm. One was as a zombie and one was as a, um, as a native of the, of the um, home planet. Um, so, but what was great was that you really could see what was interesting to me was the way that people created this world. And a big part of the creation of a world is, um, is physical acting and, and, and the physicality of a person. So, um, I, for the zombie role, I had the most incredible makeup on, you know, it was, it was almost like a, like a movie makeup, um, Mm. that made me look like it. Uh, and the, the characterization that you would have to put into it. And that was really great because I was able to see kind of behind the curtain, um, and get to know a lot of these people who had been doing it for a long time. So that was cool. Yeah. And what did you come out, like one of your kind of main findings or things that you learned and presented back in your thesis, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. 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 Um, so the biggest thing that I learned was um, about rules. And I know that sounds almost obvious, but at the time you would go in and you wouldn't understand how much of rules create a world. And the fact that um, you had to abide by the rules in order to create play, because in this type of environment, you would think, oh, man, it's a free for all. Anything goes. But in fact, there are a lot of rules that governed uh, play and interactions between people. And if you there were unspoken rules and there were written rules. So there'd be a rule where, for instance, um, again, back to fight, fighting, is that you would have to be hit a certain number of times and then you would be incapacitated. So that's a written rule. But there were, was also uh, there were also unwritten rules. And one of the most interesting ones was about spoiling the game. Mm. And spoiling the game means that you're not only playing for if if you spoil the game, it means that you're not making the game fun for other people. So you really had to a big part of the game was playing your best, but also ensuring that the people around you had a fun time. That's Um, interesting because that's like also similar to some of the principles in well theater and certainly improv comedy that I also talked about with Heather. Which is, you know, you got to be providing play for the other person uh, in the way that you're speaking. It's just, otherwise, you're just you're cutting you're cutting off the action if you're only thinking of yourself. It's quite interesting. A hundred percent. And there was a big problem because one of the reasons that the system ended um, was that you'd have these characters that would become almost too powerful, mm-hmm. and then once a character for you, it, if a character becomes too powerful, that would mean that they inflict a lot of damage or they have a lot of magic and it was fun for the person initially but it would mean that the system almost was was termed broken and it would make the entire system not fun for anyone um so that i think that was a really big part of it interesting yeah and for a long time and this is something you just briefly mentioned talking about harry potter and how you know while the geek stuff is coming into the mainstream or has Mm -hmm. already depending on Uh Uh, and you know for a long time in the 80s uh there was a lot of there was a lot of controversy around role-playing games in general, live-action role-playing games in particular, and it, there's a, it's a bit cut off or uh, or seen as nerdy and weird for a long time. I don't know if that's changed. Do you think that's changed or changed in a good way? Or um, I think that, or it that's could a really, change. I don't know. No, that's a really good question. Um, I think in the U.S., the concept of geek chic has become kind of normalized. Yeah. Um, but it, there's almost there's a there's an acceptance of it. Mm-hmm. Some some parts are accepted, some parts aren't. So you'll have uh, 
for instance, Vin Diesel, Matt, like huge action star, he just created this new movie, The Witch Hunter, yep. based on his D and D character. You know, like that yes. is totally mainstream. And the, but, one of the promotion videos was mm-hmm. uh, they played a role playing game, tabletop role playing game, with Vin Diesel. Absolutely. Yeah. And you'll have show like you'll have things like superheroes, which I mean are the biggest blockbusters in the US. But at the same time, um, there is I, I think there definitely is there's it's still kind of no, I, it's it, excuse me. Uh, in role fun. models, for instance, where LARPing is portrayed, it is portrayed as a very nerdy activity. Yeah. Um and so it that hasn't quite necessarily reached the mainstream. But in other ways, I really feel like, man, who who's allowed to make fun of nerds anymore, considering that everyone's on an iPhone, you yes. know? <laughs> That's my logic. Yes. Yeah. And it's pretty good logic. I agree with yeah. that. <laughs> so now you mentioned you work at the Barbarian Group, which, yes. funny enough, is, is a really funny agency name to be working after mm-hmm. studying live action role play. It <laughs> seems quite fitting. And it's a good agency. I mean, they have a very, very good re- re- uh, reputation. Sorry. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, so on your day-to-day, you work on, do you work on Pepsi then? or? Um, I was working on Pepsi at the time. Now I work on Brisk, which is an iced tea okay. uh, owned by PepsiCo. Okay. And um, I work on IBM some, sometimes. Cool. Yeah. yeah. And how do you take some of the stuff that you learned and studied in cultural anthropology, not just LARP, but anything else, mm-hmm. and apply it in your day-to-day job? Yeah. So I think there's a tendency um, in that you can really get into a rut in any, in any job, but even in advertising. And I think what's important about the strategist role, I'm a, I'm a strategy, I do strategy at the barbarian group is to really understand how people actually feel about products and actually uh, work. So for instance, recently we were pitching a makeup brand, uh, a makeup brand. Mm -hmm. um, And I was, you know, working on the pitch. And the first thing that I did other than of course, you know, doing desk research was actually going into a makeup store and talking to makeup artists, talking to uh, interviewing people who are really into makeup, talking to people who aren't into makeup and really using that and forming conclusions about how people wear makeup and what their relationship is. Um, And I think that's something that's really important in my cultural background, my cultural anthropology background really helped me with is just saying, you know what, I can only really learn so many things from blogs and books. There's, there's really something to be said for going out. And um, I, I, I love that. I love that aspect. The head of my uh, head of strategy for my department is a former journalist, and he really encourages that as well. Um, talking and and experiencing, yeah. uh, and just to form conclusions. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you have any recommendations? I mean, it's great that you have. Of course, your head of strategy supports that. Uh, but mm-hmm. I know, and you know, from hearing a lot of some of the people who work in this line of business, that sometimes mm-hmm. everybody, well, most people want to do that, but sometimes it's tough. You get, you know plugged into like you have all this stuff to deliver and all this work and then and then you'd like i'd love to go out but i don't have time to and then you know mm-hmm. kind of get into that kind of like vicious uh, vicious circle and along those lines do you have any recommendations to get you out of it and like yeah um i that that is definitely a tough one i think that's again i've been really lucky to do that but i think honestly it's car it's this is a simple one but carving out time on during your lunch break, even I put like a little hold on my calendar, say I have a meeting and that meeting is actually meeting the world. Um, or if it is, you know, even if it's a change of scenery for doing that research is just going to a coffee shop. I think that's something that is so important. And the Mm -hmm. barbarian group, like we're in the middle of Chelsea in, in New York, there's a lot of places. It's really busy. It's really inspiring all the time. Um, and so we'll just go out and sit somewhere else and talk and, I think it's it's important to develop that sense um, of of being inspired by the world and not just what's on a piece of paper. Yeah. So most of the work you're doing is uh, tends to be digital, online, that kind of stuff, right? Yes, primarily digital. Mm-hmm. And I read on your website, you're, it says you're, you say, wrote, you're a firm mm-hmm. believer that sci-fi predicts the future. Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. I need to update that website. But uh, absolutely. <laughs> um, I don't disagree with i i still i still say that um i think there's something really delightful about uh, science fiction and that you're able to you're able to fantasize about what what the possibilities are i mean just look at again star trek i mean yeah. you're looking at, at at an ipad 60 years like 40 40 years ago what they, do you think the next prediction is what's your what's your prediction for what's going on now Ooh, okay 
Oh, that's really that fun. Inspired by sci-fi, um, obviously, right? Inspired by sci-fi. I mean, I don't think that we'll have cash at some point. I think that definitely 50, I, I don't know. I mean, Sweden already is experimenting, I think, with a cashless society. Hmm. Um, so maybe it's sci-fi and Nordic countries predict the future. I think that maybe, maybe, maybe I'll have to adjust that one. Did you also hear, I just heard from someone uh, last week that apparently Finland just announced they're starting to phase out the teaching of handwriting to kids. Really? I did not hear that. I didn't, I didn't double check the oh. fact, but I was told that. Yeah. Uh, so I need to double check the fact. So just based on the, you know, well, we're not, we, there's no point in teaching them cursive and really mm-hmm. going through the whole thing because just going to be typing. Let's just put them yeah. down to typing. We learn, you know, basic handwriting and then just move on. No, totally fair. I think, I mean, honestly, I think that the same way conference calls today are standard for most, most businesses, I would say, I would, I really believe that VR headsets are going to change the way we interact with one another across the world. Um, if you've been inside a, re, a very realistic VR thing, it's, it's, de- it's disorienting, it but is, it's yeah. extremely lifelike. Um, so I think, I think I'll, I'm going to keep an eye on VR. Yes. I, that's that's what, what, that's one about. of the big topics that everybody is talking mm-hmm. about this year in terms of media. I was lucky to try mm-hmm. one last week, actually. Oh, uh, really? I tried the HTC, uh, what is it called again? Vive, Vive or something like that? Uh, yeah, yeah. What did you think? Uh, it's really good. It's really impressive. It is super immersive. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at the same time, you know, it was it was at this production company and at the floor where there's the demo set and people doing meetings and coffee and lunch next door to it. So you had a bit of noise behind. And mm-hmm. of course, the two people giving me the demo. So it's brilliant. But at the same time, I'm quite self i was a bit self-conscious of like what do mm-hmm. i look like right now w- yeah with my hands flailing around and at the same time really like wow this is amazing and you're in, so you're in this box that it kind of looked you know realistic but still it was made like a video game a little bit so mm-hmm. you're not like completely confused as to where you were mm-hmm. uh, and i also listened recently to a podcast about the virtual reality and uh and the this idea that at the moment most of the successful environments are closed off mm-hmm uh, there's some experiments in like going up and down, but people get nauseous. Uh, so they, uh, they're like not sure exactly how useful that would be to make people feel nauseous. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Well, it, it's really cool. Sorry, this is a really fascinating subject to me, but there was this one project. It was essentially a horror project where they mm-hmm. sat you in a wheelchair uh-huh. and they we, and you put the VR headset on and you were wheeled through this horrific uh, mental hospital. Oh, wow. um, it was really, me- it was it was uh, it was like a haunted house. I have not heard um, about that. Yeah, I would definitely check it out. But what was really neat about it was that because you were in this wheelchair, you were seated, they could kind of control your movements. So if they wanted to, it wouldn't be these this up down, which absolutely does induce nausea. But with this um, wheelchair, they could stop you suddenly, or they could turn you right or left. Nothing crazy, but it definitely impacted the way that you yeah. would experience this wow. VR. Yeah. So I don't I, remember what it was called. I'll have to check it out. I'll try to yeah. find it. There's a there's going to be an event in London. I think next month or the following. Mm-hmm. I can't remember exactly, but it's already all sold out. Uh, uh-huh. It's going to be a, a haunted house zombie virtual reality experience. Oh wow! So you're going to be like in some <laughs> giant warehouse with uh-huh. the virtual reality sets on and there's actors around you playing the zombies that are going to be like touching you and everything and you have to escape them it seems absolutely terrifying oh my gosh that's crazy yeah i don't i i, I really don't like zombies actually um even though i played one um i really that creeps me out the only zombies i can read are in comic books and that's it can't even <laughs> see them on stage yeah on screen uh and um, also read you you, you mm-hmm. listen to a bunch of podcasts as well or some of them right yes um, so, well, it's, it's funny. Um, we're actually, so I listened to this American life, which yep. is a very popular podcast yes. on the U S serial. Yes. Um, w- yep. Uh, uh, reply all, which is fantastic uh, podcast. I love okay, it. Fantastic. Amazing. Um, and one that I've recently been listening to, uh, since I moved here is called the Bowery boys, uh, oh, which is them. about the history of New York. Oh, cool. So yeah, it's, it's my, my boss turned me on to it. And again, just, I, I'm I'm so jealous that you're in London just because of the his, the rich history and all the, like the secret little places in the city. Um, That's never one aware. of the things I love yeah. about Europe in general. I, mm-hmm. I really considered moving to these to the states after mm-hmm. having lived in Asia, mm-hmm. but I really love Europe's old stones. Mm-hmm. I, I like being close to them. 
yeah, I completely agree. Um, Utrecht, um, if, have you been to Utrecht in the Netherlands? Actually, or? no, I haven't. I've been to a bunch of places in the Netherlands, but not to Utrecht. I would definitely well, I did go th- like mm-hmm. through, but I didn't really visit properly. It's uh, this is my tourism plug for Utrecht yep. is that it's so beautiful. It's I think the secret jewel of the Netherlands. Um, the Tour de France started there this year, um, mm-hmm. so people started to see how special it was. But it's cobblestone streets, old buildings, um, wonderful. When you're there, there's a there's a coffee uh, coffee house called the Village Coffee and Music, which is the best coffee I've, I think I've ever had. Um, so it's 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 but I miss that old feel. And move, living in New York is, I think, the closest in the U.S. where you can get to that. Um, you know, there's you know skyscrapers everywhere and all this new stuff, but you're able to find those little secret pockets. And yeah. the Bowery Boys is all about the history of New York, so I really Sounds like cool. that. I'll check it out. Yeah, I haven't been to um, New York in a long time. I was born in Long yeah. Island, by the way. Oh, really? So yeah, I was about nearby. to say. I would love to learn a little bit more about your own traveling history. Yeah, <laughs> we'll do that at some point. <laughs> Perfect. Um, <laughs> I'm mindful of time. I know you don't have mm-hmm. that much time, so we'll finish. Oh, I usually finish with a couple of cool down questions. Okay. Uh, and I want to try, uh, I'm testing a couple of new questions. Mm-hmm. So uh, this is the ice cream for everyone podcast. So I've got to have an ice cream question. Okay. <laughs> what of your favorite food do you think deserves to be made into an ice cream flavor? Oh, that is such a great question. Um, okay. Apple pie ice cream. I, I like I like a sweet ice cream. Yeah. Um, so I think that's important. Um, yeah, I, apple I like pie some, ice cream. Apple pie ice cream. I yeah. have to try. I th- I'm sure it's been made, but I wonder sure. how exactly. Like, uh, yeah. it would be worth trying. What would make it good to to make it? I don't know. A good experience of an apple pie. All right, good. Yeah, uh, or cornbread ice cream actually would also be really interesting. That would be really interesting. Right? Oh, I would have thought yeah. about that. Yeah, cornbread with like cornbread ice cream, maybe with like a sweet barbecue sauce on top. Have that a whole experience. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. a good idea. All right, right? cool. I, I, this is a good question. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> um, let's see. What else going to – so another example or another – so this is a, a weird – so I come – all right. So I'm thinking about brands. Um, mm-hmm. thinking about gaming. Mm-hmm. Uh. And brands, there's there's have been a bunch of brands that have tried to use games inside of their marketing, and the gamification has been like a popular word for a few years. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if you followed any of that. Do you do you can you remember an example of a of a marketing activity from a brand that was done well as a game? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, we've had some cool ideas here, but what we've been working on, um, I'm going to give a a plug for my, our own agency is that, um, what can I say? Um, is that, (laughs) so the barbarian group working with Pepsi created, like helped create the new loyalty program. Mm -hmm. Um, and they've got an app called Pepsi pass and it's about gaming with your friends. Um, and basically you earn points via hanging out and, uh, going to like Pepsi locations. And I think that's a really interesting way. Um, just because it's, I think loyalty apps are really great way to bring in gamification. And I think there are a lot of interesting ways of going about it. You know, Starbucks has, Starbucks's app is really well known for its success. Um, Sephora as well, but that it's a typical kind of buy something, earn something. But I think loyalty programs is really where you're going to start seeing some opportunity for, for gamification in a consumer's life. Because let's be honest, they're not going to go to, you know, they're, they're not going to go to like, I can't even think of kind bars, for instance, for a for a game. They're going to go to the things that they they know for a game. Mm-hmm. So, how can you bring in gamification into your consumer's life? Is I think the opportunity. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. The tough thing about that is, at the same time, I agree with you, but it's mm-hmm. also very tricky because yeah. Well, a lot of people don't really have time for brands, and they're not really thinking about the products that yeah. you know, just have a craving and go do it. Did you Absolutely. read uh, How Brands Grow by Ian Sharp? Um, it's really funny. My my friend has it. He's reading it, and yeah. he's gonna give it to me afterwards. I'm, yeah. I'm the same. I need to read it. It's okay. like it's getting to an embarrassing level because every strategic planner I talk to yes. like has read it, mm-hmm. and I'm I'm still. Mm-hmm. I, I was looking at your reading list. I mean, I've been writing a reading list as well. I'm catching up on a bunch of stuff, mm-hmm. but I've been just reading less. But I have been told, <laughs> okay, <laughs> that in on. this mm-hmm. book, uh, that one of the major parts of parts of what he talks about is that basically people don't really do loyalty. Right. That, like most of the mass of sales and volume of sales from large brands such as Coke, Pepsi, detergents, et cetera, 
come from people buying it a couple of times a year yeah. without thinking about it. And most of the growth comes from market share. Yeah. Uh, because, well, you know, people kind of like it, but they don't really pay that much attention to it. If they feel like it, they'll buy it. But like really for the big, big brands, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so which makes it difficult then to, to, to argue for building loyalty programs, even though there's a large part of our work as advertising agencies tends to focus on that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so no, I don't I, know if you have any thoughts or comments on that. No, I, I, it's I a think tough that's, question, I think right? I know it's a tough question. No, you're absolutely right. And I think that's something that, you know, we're constantly debating, you know, that, that I, you know, me and my coworkers, me and my friends are debating, you know, how I, I, I agree. I mean, it's, and it's true. People. Um, I, I think there was this, there was this article in the financial times about uh, eight months ago, um, called how Ma the Mad Men lost its step or something yes. like that. Yeah. yeah I, remember I, read that. Yep. I, I love that one because it's something that we always struggle with because if, if we're built on the backs of single purchases once a year, then why are we doing this? Like, and I know that's like a terrible, it's, I think it's a terrible way because I'm not trying to argue myself out of a job, mm -hmm. but, um, I think that it's, it really is, it's a, it's a, it's a struggle and it's a difficult question, yeah. um, how to, how to make our roles relevant. Yeah. Well, not to finish mm -hmm. on a on a, that kind of like negative mm -hmm. and dire note. <laughs> <laughs> Go back to the cornbread uh, to the ice well, cream. Well, the ice cream cornbread was a good way to finish. <laughs> but I would just I would just add just to you know make sure that there I, I do believe that there's a there's a role for there is a role for us and there is a role for advertising agencies as as mm -hmm. an outside perspective person and just like from everything that you were selling these kinds of studies understanding how people function best and trying to yeah. find this ideal it's not always doesn't always work out but the ideal triptych of making sure that the value of the product and brand is going to be matched with the kind of stuff that the person as a consumer or the person is looking for or hoping for and finding an angle that's going to bring this type of communication the advertising essentially that to be interesting funny mm -hmm. useful in mm -hmm. some way for people uh and beyond that I was also talking to another person a few days ago, and that's going to come out in the podcast or will have by the time we publish this one, uh, talking with a person called Philippa White from uh, an organization called the International Exchange. And okay. she has a deep rooted belief that uh, our job as creative communication uh, in creative communications can be used to make a difference. So she organizes her NGO organizes mm -hmm. programs where they send um, professionals in the advertising and marketing industry, so either on client or agency side, mm -hmm. to go and take their skills and apply them in the middle of a developing country for a charity or an NGO that needs it. Cool. Uh, really and, and all the results that are coming out of that are extremely encouraging to say that, you know what, when it's applied properly, and it really does make a difference because it's making a difference to organizations that need and that can use the the skills of, of a professional in the communications and marketing industry. That's right. So, um, so uh, maybe I went a little bit note too high. We can bring it back to the <laughs> cornbread with barbecue. Mm -hmm. but <laughs> no, no, I, I completely agree with you. I wasn't trying to be negative. No, no, uh, but no, just, no, no. I, I, like, I, yeah. I launched this thing. <laughs> I like, I like taking the, uh, I like taking the, the devil's advocate position um, in a lot too. of ways. Um, yes. But I think there's a lot of opportunity, and I'm really, I think I really like your podcast. Um, Thank you. I'm not just saying, yeah, just because I think there's we can learn a lot from one another. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's great that you're continuing that com communication worldwide and bringing it, bringing all of that together. Yeah, so I think yeah. that's really, really neat. Um, and you. hearing different perspectives from different disciplines. So well, if people yeah. want to find you anything, any last messages, I'll put your Twitter account. You, they can follow you on Twitter. Is there anything else to uh, plug, promote? Oh, um, well, nope. That's, that's, that's it for me. No, no. <laughs> cause you. I wanted to say, cause my, my friends and I are considering creating a podcast at some point. So oh, I really? need to talk to you, uh, sure. yes, uh, about, to. uh, your experiences with that. Um, because, well, I mean, yeah. you got Gimlet is around the corner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That that would be amazing. Um, that's I, the, I would like. That's I really love what they do, uh, mm -hmm. and it's very interesting. As you said, you listen to Reply All. I would try mm -hmm. to. I would try to meet with one of them. Yeah, and chat to them. That's a good idea. Of course, I'm cool. happy to talk to you, but I'm still very much a beginner. I want to go <laughs> talk to more people as well. Yeah. Cool. I, I I'll definitely do that. Well, um, hell, it was yeah. really such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank and, you, uh, And we'll talk soon. Cool. Thank you very much. All right. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the conversation I had with Rahel. I enjoyed it. It was a fantastic conversation. So much fun. 
I mean, you must have enjoyed it a little bit. You're listening to the end. I think I did that joke in the last outro. I mean, I'm just going to keep doing it until I find something better to say. But uh, the main thing, and this is repeating, and, you know, I'm going to find other ways to say it, but it's still going to be the same message. If you're still listening to me and you enjoyed the show, please share it with a friend. You've got to know somebody else who will enjoy it too, whether they work in strategy, whether they work, you know, interested in live action role playing games. Or just you just thought the conversation was fun. I mean, I try as much as possible to make the conversations interesting, fun, and accessible, whether you are into the topics of advertising and marketing or not. So whether I succeed, I'd love to know. I'd love to hear more about it. So if you have thoughts, that'd be fantastic. Uh, so share it with a friend. You can also find more goodies, as I said at the beginning, on the Ice Cream for Everyone website. That's www.icecreamforeveryone.net. And uh, that's it for now. You can, you know, contact me in the usual channels, like the Facebook page on Ice Cream, the Ice Cream for Everyone page on Facebook. I'm tiring now. Uh, or you just, you know, ask questions, get in touch, follow my links on Twitter. That's at HippoWill. That's about it for now. And that's completely it. I'm done with my self-promotion. Thank you so much for listening once again. Really, really appreciate your time. And uh, if you have any feedback, any questions, again, just keep in touch. Don't hesitate. Uh, until next time, thank you so much. Bye-bye.